one of my top tips for homeschooling and streamlining all the other hats that we wear, all the other things that we do, is to keep up with my top three for each day. And I try to write down when I'm when all those things are buzzing around in my head at night, if I can just sit down and for the week make a top three. If I need to schedule dentist appointments and I need to, you know, catch up on laundry and all, you know, whatever it is, I will put a top three top three priorities for each day and that helps me to break it down I may not get to all three today and that is okay um, I but it helps me to break it down into just um, three big priorities for each day our topic this week is balancing all things homeschool and life I just wanted to mention that sometimes balancing things out might mean to actually just let go and take some time off when you need to, when unexpected things come up, and that is okay. I have been away from home all week helping a family member. It was unexpected and short notice, and I actually packed up two things of contact solution and didn't bring any contacts, so that's life sometimes. Uh, my daughter is in high school now, so things are pretty much going, you know, just as normal at home. She's working independently. But if you have younger kids, it is okay if they take time off of their regular schedule when unexpected things come up. Um, just think about the life lessons there are to be learned even when you are off your regular schedule. Uh, they can witness how family is a priority. They can see the work of the body of Christ, your brothers and sisters at church that pull together to help during difficult times. And when things do get derailed by life, remember uh, this verse, Romans 8, 28, that we know that God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I have two tips for managing your home while you homeschool. Number one, get rid of stuff. The less stuff you have to manage, the less clutter you're going to have, the less cleaning you'll have to do. So that means only keep your very favorite things, your very favorite toys for your kids, clothes that fit them, anything else. If it is too small and you are saving it for another child, store it. Put it up in the attic, put it in the basement, put it under the bed, but don't leave it in a drawer. Toys, get rid of broken things, get rid of things that are relegated to the back of the clo closet. Or if there are, if you just have too many toys, but they really do kind of play with everything, then rotate them. Put some up high up in a closet or up in the attic or in the basement. And then every couple months, rotate them out. And so that way, those toys that they had kind of gotten tired of and had gotten stale are now fresh and new again. And there's less stuff for you to pick up. Number two, meal plan. I am a big proponent of eating together as a fa family. I did it as a child growing up in my home. That's what we did. And so I continued that in my own home. And I love to eat. I love good food. And it's cheaper to cook at home. So make a plan, even if it's simple. Simple. It doesn't have to be a three-course meal or, you know, 14 sides or anything gourmet. It can be simple. But just if you have a plan, then you don't have to at 4 o'clock figure out what it is that you need to cook and you forgot to defrost the meat or you forgot to go to the store and buy the Brussels sprouts or whatever it is. So have a meal plan. There are so many ways to make a meal plan, but the way I found that worked for me was to have a meal matrix, which means you have a theme for each day. So you've heard of Taco Tuesday or Pizza Fri Friday, do that for the whole rest of the week. I also found that if you plan for four days, then you can save one day for a clean out the fridge kind of a day. So whether that's a weekend day, like maybe Sunday afternoon, it's your Sabbath and you don't wanna cook, so Sunday can be your clean out day. Or maybe you go out to on a date on Saturday and so you want Sunday to be a fa family time, then maybe Thursday can be your clean out the fridge before pizza Friday, dates Saturday, and family dinner Sunday. So come up with a meal plan, a meal matrix, and, uh, and then you can shop from that list. It's gonna save you money, it's gonna save you time. Enlist your kids' help. All three of my kids are great cooks because they learn to, to cook right alongside me. They have knife skills, they can cook things for their girlfriends, um, and, it's a good thing. So how do we keep our plates spinning or how do we keep all the jobs going? So here's just one thing. We had lots of schedules going on. I had four kids when they were all at home. We had sporting events. We had music things. We had co-op. We had field trips, um, husband schedule, my work schedule, 
just, there was a lot to juggle and I had a paper planner that I kept and that's where the, the brains of our family was, was in my paper planner. But this was a look at, um, at a glance so everyone would know. My husband could come by and see if I had an empty day or if it was a busy day and everyone had their own colors. So um, I have the yellow one out, but that was, you know, I could just show you that like Mary, my third child, she had a birthday, so she had something written in yellow. The last one that still lives at home, he's blue. And so he, I write down his events in blue. Mine, purple's my favorite color. So purple is what gets written down. And then you'll see a bunch of things in brown. And that has taken over as our generic, um, just things that are going on that I everyone should be aware of. That's how we kept our life scheduled. Plus this is two months and it's wet erase. So like I can wipe my hand across it. It's not gonna come off like a dry erase, but I can take a wet towel and I can wipe it all off and use it again. We've been using this particular one actually for about 12 years now. Um, it has been a perfect solution. I hope that's helpful. That might spark an idea for you. Um, and I hope that your homeschool days are easier. My favorite way to streamline my life and balance all the things is to keep everything I need to do in one place. So I'm very much a digital person. I don't like to write things down or keep paper in various places. So I do it all in my phone. And the way I do this is I have our family calendar in a widget on my home screen so that I can click on the day and see exactly where people need to go and when. That way our family is taken care of. I also rely on apps for everything. Um, I'm talking meal planning and shopping lists, um, tracking the books I'm reading, doing Bible study, finding my workouts, you know, whatever it is, I do it through an app because again, my phone is always with me. I can access that wherever I am and it's small. I, I'm very much a minimalist, so the less I have to carry around, the better. Then the other thing that we do in our house is everybody has specific chores that they are responsible for each week, but then the daily chores, everybody knows how to do. And we take a very collaborative approach to life, whether that be chores or cooking meals or homeschooling. We do it all together in our family. And so there's not really a set this is something that only I do and this is something only this person does, except when it comes to our weekly chores. And those were basically assigned by, I don't mind cleaning bathrooms, so that's my chore. My husband doesn't mind vacuuming and mopping, so that's his chore. You know, that's kind of the way we figured that out. But I would encourage you to look at your family, figure out what people like to do, what they're good at, what they're capable of, and then figure out a way to track everything. So whether that be digital in your phone, or whether that be a kitchen command center, a paper planner, whatever's gonna work best for you that you're going to use, that will be your best option. One of the things that we do to keep balance in our homeschool life is to schedule in things that are fun, just for the purpose of being fun. Um, we have sometimes gotten so caught up in checking off boxes and getting the right things done and you know completing a full day and making sure we finish whatever the assignment is that we can spend the whole day and then the whole week doing very, very important things and not remember to get out and go walk in the sand and and walk in the woods and go to the playground and have ice cream with friends. And so to keep balance, I started scheduling it. I started making sure that those things were included in our week because it is good for the soul and it's good for the brains. The change of scenery, the um, anticipation of something to look forward to are good for the mom and good for the kids. Hi. My biggest tip at keeping your life organized while you're a homeschool mom is routine. So I don't need a schedule that's hard and fast, but I do need to have some idea of how each day and week is going to flow. So that might mean always washing your sheets on Tuesday or always serving chicken on Monday. So that eliminates a lot of decision fatigue. It doesn't have to be the same, but just having some idea of what's gonna happen each day or each week um, helps make things a lot easier when you're trying to juggle all the hats that we have to wear. One of the hats that moms have to wear is cook or chef. And 
that was very stressful for me as a young mom with lots of small children. So one of the things that I came up with to help me was to develop a five week evening meal menu plan with 25 meals. So I would plan for five evening meals a week, assuming I would have enough for two days of leftovers. So that would be about 25 different meals. And I developed my shopping list based on that week of meals. I tried to come up with like a pasta dish for the first week on Monday. The next week I had a pasta dish somewhere, but I, I didn't do all pasta one week, all beef one week, you know, anything like that. I tried to make it a, a variety, but to have 25 meals on a five week rotation took the guesswork out of grocery shopping for me. And then I had a week meal, a week long meal plan for breakfast and for lunch. So every Monday we would have oatmeal for breakfast and grilled cheese for lunch. Every Tuesday we would have, I don't know, cold cereal for breakfast and mac and cheese for lunch, something. Um, and so we had a weekly breakfast and lunch schedule and then a five week rotation for evening meals. It helped me tremendously so that I didn't have to think about meals. And when you're in the thick of uh, schooling or just parenting, a lot of children who are little, uh, taking the guest or even when they're older takes a lot of guesswork out of it. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's homeschool helps and hacks balancing life's juggling act. I am Sunny. I'm Sunlight's community manager and I am excited to be joined today by Ann and Christy, two of your Sunlight mentors. And we're going to be talking about all the things you have to balance. I mean, when you're parenting, you're already balancing a lot of things. And when you homeschool, sometimes it feels like you're throwing in several more things. So we are going to give you some ideas and tips and tricks to make sure that you can manage all the things happening in your life. If you are watching this right now, or if you want to watch it again later, we are recording it. So you will have access to the video again, both in our Sunlight Connections app, and then we'll probably post on YouTube as well. Also, we are live. So if you have specific questions, please drop those in the chat. Jonna and Amber are assisting us with those for anything we can't get to. But whatever the three of us can get to today, we definitely will. So let's start with some quick introductions, ladies. Anne, you're on the top, so I'll let you go first. All right, hello, my name is Anne. I'm coming to you from Texas. And I've got two kids, uh, only homeschooling one right now. I have a junior in high school and homeschooling, and my son is wrapping up his freshman year in college uh, this next week. Exciting times. It's exciting. Well, thank you for joining us. Christy, why don't you tell us more about yourself? Hi, I'm glad you're here. Um, this is my 14th year of sunlighting and um, we have four boys. Um, the oldest is away in college and is, he's finishing his second year. He's technically a junior, he would say, but he is finishing his second year thanks to dual enrollment. He has that junior designation. Um, and then we have um, a son graduating next month and then we have two who are, will be in ninth and 11th grade in the fall. Well, perfect. Thank you both for being here. I don't think I even mentioned my kids. I have a 14-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old son. So I also have been homeschooling since my daughter was in preschool. And we joke that my son's been a sunlighter his entire life because even <laughs> as a baby, he was right there with us. Um, so we'll talk a little bit for those of you with littles too that are wondering how you get all the things done, what you can do, because I think we all were there at one point, <laughs> even though our kids are older now. So I wanted to start with a question, though, that came from Katrina in the app asking about following through with your plans when you're tired, because before we jump into all the different ways to plan different things, you know, what do you do when you're tired? What she said specifically was, I plan to finish our read aloud at bedtime or math after dinner, and then I crash. I'm struggling to break some of those patterns. So what ideas do you have if you're somebody who makes big plans, but you can't seem to follow through with them? Mm -hmm. uh, I've experienced that myself, even just kind of sitting here waiting, you know, for this to start. I'm just kind of, oh, man, I'm getting kind of tired. Um, so it definitely <laughs> happens. When I used to be a full time teacher, when the school day was over, I just had to, to crash. So I know exactly what you're talking about. My best advice is actually to get up and move around and take a walk. Um, get, getting, getting going, you kind of have to make yourself do it because, you know, you'd much rather just go to bed early or take a nap, but really if you get up and moving a little bit, uh, it really does help. Yeah. 
I would say that um, in the early years, I started out um, doing things differently. And somewhere along the way, I would say somewhere in my 40s, <laughs> then I started having to adjust the schedule because there was no way that read alouds were going to happen in the afternoon without me taking a nap in the middle of them. I did say I, I need a 15 minute nap in the middle of some read alouds in the afternoon, but um, I started moving the longer read alouds to the morning. I just had to do that. So you might need a schedule adjustment that might help. Um, uh, so yeah, that was my best tip. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, the the uh, person who posted that mentioned math after dinner, and that, that was a no go in my house. We never, <laughs> ever, ever do math after dinner. That definitely had to be one of the first things we did. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm actually the opposite of these two ladies. I think you should <laughs> know yourself. I've always been a night owl, and for years I had heard, you know, the early bird gets the worm, get up, you know, work out in the morning, do your Bible study in the morning. And it was misery for me. My body is just not wired that way. Um, if I try to wake up early to do something, I'm kind of half asleep. But yeah, you'll find me at midnight, you know, finishing up a book or whatever on my own. That's my favorite time to spend, you know, doing my own things. Um, and so we actually do school later in the day in our house. I'm fortunate that I'm also married to a night owl and I have two night owl children. So none of us are on different schedules. And so we often do school in the afternoon or the evening um, because in the morning we are just not happy people. So kind of know yourself, know when your best times are, know when your kids' best times are, and really try to use those as the best time to do things. Um, and I love what you said about getting up and moving around. I mean, if you're in the middle of it and you are tired, stand up to read aloud or, you know, maybe you can read at the kitchen counter while your child's eating because you're not going to fall asleep while you're eating, you know, unless it's a really young child. Um, so usually things like that are, are what I try. But yeah, definitely look at who you are. Oh, we have a great suggestion from Emily in the comments. She said she likes to substitute a couple of books each year as uh, audiobooks that can be played. Um, and she said she can be found sleeping on the couch. I love that. Um, <laughs> but that's also great if you're driving somewhere, too. If you happen to be out and about away from the house a lot, audiobooks are great because, again, unless your child has a tendency to fall asleep in the car, that will help them absorb some of that as well. So let's talk a little bit about those routines and things that work in your home. I mean, we mentioned that we all kind of like a different schedule and we all are wired a little differently, but let's start several of the mentors in their earlier videos talked about meal prepping and cooking. And I know for a lot of families, when you have your kids there all day, it feels like it's a revolving door in the kitchen sometimes that people are eating all day. You know, we all have boys. So I think we're used to boys eating a lot as well. So what are some solutions that you guys have found for making that meal prepping or cooking meals easier despite everyone being there all day? I think one of the biggest um, hurdles for meals is decisions. You know, we have decision fatigue. There are so many decisions that we make on a daily basis as a mom in the house, you know, with people that need things, need all the things to go in the right direction. So I think um, my best advice there on the meals is to get people involved in the decision making. Um, if you, you, you know, just ask every now and then and find out, I mean, you, I've heard of people doing taco Tuesday and, you know, soup Wednesday, sal you know, whatever, to have the, you know, different days that you do different meals and that removes the decision making. So that's a great idea. Um, but also ask the people in your house, you know, is there something we haven't had lately that you would like? And that's often my way to find some inspiration to kind of wake up the excitement about getting in the kitchen or finishing. Actually, I'll be honest and say my husband gets in the kitchen. He's the one that does most. Um, now everybody can throw tomatoes if they want to, but he really does. But um, deciding is a big thing. And if I can help with organizing sometimes and getting um, some ideas from people, that kind of brings new life into that planning, you know, the drudgery of planning it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, planning the shopping list 
has been something that uh, being organized with that has really helped. Um, I have a paper planner and I put in it what all we're going to do this week. So you've got, you know, gymnastics one day, a baseball game one day. And so we've never been able to do Taco Tuesday, Soup Wednesday. We've <laughs> done, well, this has to be a slow cooker day because we're going to be out of the ball field until whatever time. So we need dinner to be ready when we get home. And so based on our schedule, the week, usually Saturday, the Saturday before, I will sit down and look at that, pick the recipes. And like Christy said, I ask my family, hey, what do you want to eat this week? And then they'll tell me and I'll put different recipes on different days, make my shopping list, go one time to the store, get everything. If I didn't get it, too bad. <laughs> we'll just have to wait till next week um, and, uh, and, and do it that way. Yeah, I love what you said about getting your family involved in it, too. Um, I know for me, the decision fatigue on Mondays was like, overwhelming. I, the rest of the week I was fine, but Mondays it was like, we're back in school routines. I'm back to work. Like I cannot think about this. So I told my husband, I said, I don't care what we eat on Mondays, but I want you to figure that out. And, and so I was like, it doesn't matter if you pick up food, if you we eat frozen pizzas, if you cook something, I do not care, but I am not doing Monday. The rest of the week though, I will do a meal plan um, using the contributions of my family. I have some kind of picky family members. So, you know, I do listen to them. But like I mentioned in my video, I rely on apps for everything. Mm -hmm. And I do that for my meal planning as well. Um, personally, I use Meal Lime, but it makes the shopping list for me. And you mentioned that as something you did not like. Neither did I. If I found all these great recipes, I never wanted to figure out what. <laughs> I needed to make and I like good variety. So I'm not making the same meals. I know Amber in her video mentioned making the same meals. So then you can really hone in on what your shopping list is. Um, let's talk a little bit about the kids in the home too. When can they start maybe cooking for themselves? This I think is the best thing I ever did was teaching my kids to feed themselves during the day. Um, my husband and I only make dinner in our house and we've been like that for a while. Um, but what are some ways to maybe help your kids learn those skills when they're little so that you don't have to hear mom, I'm hungry all day long. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. We do the kids do their own breakfast and lunch because we just have simple things on hand all the time. And um, so that the, it really I, I kind of wish I'd taken notes now as to when, you know, what ages they did these different things. But I mean, they were pretty young. And and so I didn't have to do breakfast or lunch. It was just dinner. Um, one of the things uh, speaking of dinner when they were younger, I never, ever, ever cooked every night, you know, leftovers always the next night. And that <laughs> saves you, you know, a lot of time. Right. Right. I would say um, get them involved as much as you can. Um, I don't have any big advice for this because, as I said, my husband is the one that does the main cooking in the house. But I would say that lunches and breakfasts, they are, uh, we, we get things that on homeschool days, uh, mm -hmm. on the weekends, we cook our bigger breakfasts when we're not doing homeschool days, honestly. Mm -hmm. Though we have nicer breakfasts, bigger for um, everybody. Uh, ten, or we do breakfast for dinner sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, that's so, one of our favorites. Yeah, yeah. So that um, that tends to be when we have the bigger breakfast. But we have um, a lot of um, things that they can prepare, healthy snacks, things around, and unhealthy snacks too. <laughs> we have both, um, but we have those available so that you know during the day, you know, it's a big thing if we come in and and make something. Um, we do that sometimes, you know, cookies, oatmeal, chocolate chip, oatmeal cookies every now and then that gets everybody excited if we need to um, wake everybody up. But, um, typically, uh, during the day we're, we're working on school and we're, um, you know, having really streamlined, easy things for them to eat. Yeah. Well, I'm over <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're leftover, and that's true. Yeah, most of the time for lunch, I'm usually eating leftovers from dinner, just mm -hmm. it's quick and fast and easy. Um, but something, if you're trying to figure out ways to help your kids make a healthy meal for themselves, um, I borrowed this from my own mom. I made a list of like entree items, veggies, fruit, and then treat, and I just hung that on the fridge. And the kids learned that they had to pick one from each category to make a meal. That way they weren't just eating, you know, pudding or <laughs> whatever snacky food and saying, oh, I ate lunch because I, I definitely have one child who's a major grazer and that's exactly what he would do. Um, but then they learned how to make 
a more balanced meal. And like you guys said, having easy snacks on hand, you know, fruits and veggies and things that are easy to grab and then teach them to make sandwiches. And then when you're making dinner, incorporate them into what you're doing. Um, we're getting some questions about chores now and about rewards charts. So Alicia said, do any of you ladies use any reward system for your kids to give some motivation to get their schoolwork or chores done? I recently started this with my girls as an incentive um, and they earn special projects and crafts. Just wondering if other people have advice for helping kids get things done without feeling like I'm constantly bossing them around. So yeah. tell me what is what, whether it be school or chores or how have you guys utilized reward systems or what are some options that you've done with your kids? Yeah, we've never used a reward system, but um, my kids have always been very visual. So I've always made it a point where they can see what they have to get done that day. And when they were very young, I just got the books out that we're going to do that day and set them on the floor. And then they could go, you know, pick one here and there and we get school done throughout the day. And when they got older, I got a little, I, well, not little, it's kind of big, Ikea, uh, you know, pull out, you know, drawer type of thing. And I put their stuff in there. So they visually saw this is what I have to get done today for school. And there were just certain things that they couldn't do unless they were done with school. You know, the screen time or whatever, you know, other things like that. So, um, uh, and that, that really did work for us. Yeah. For chores, I think that my guys, we typically, um, I, I, I probably did some different uh, incentive things through the years and then it worked for a short time. That's how it happened in my house. We did. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we've done through the years is, um, just like a quick, clean up in the morning or when we finish in the afternoon, if we're getting ready to go somewhere, Hey, we have 15 minutes, we're going to set the timer and we're going to do, you know, I need you to do this, you to do this, you to do this, you to do this and send everybody off. Um, I have one son take advantage of, of gifting. Um, you know, one of my, my third born is he loves organizing things. So I always gave him the organizing jobs, you know, and he enjoyed that. Um, you know, I mix it up some so that he has experience doing the other things, but, um, I, I definitely appreciate his ability to organize because some of them have it and some of them don't, and some of us have it and some of us don't. And so I really appreciate his gifts in that area and, um, let him know that regularly. So I would say take advantage of those things that they are, they're really, um, gifted at. And that they that comes naturally and that even if you didn't ask him to organize, he's going to be organizing things. Um, but, you know, generally when we're looking at a room and there's, you know, it's hard to concentrate until there are certain things that are done. And um, I wish that I was better. I, I, I Years ago, I remember all these things when Pinterest was new or new to me. And there were, I would, you know, there were people, we were all spending all this time printing printables and then the printables, you would find them later with dust on them, you know, <laughs> and had to, so for some, for me, sometimes if I try to go and do all of those things, I spend more time on getting the system going than I do just, okay, let's just do what needs to be done, you know? And so um, I, I'm, I don't have a, a great answer on um, or great success story from from, from using a system like that. I, I tend to just say, let's get done what needs to be done and we do it. <laughs> so. yeah. I, I was going to say, I'm very much that way too. It's kind of like with sleeping, know yourself. If a reward system is going to be a lot of work for you, which I have found for me, it is. It's it's something that I have to maintain and I have to pay attention and mm -hmm. check what the kids did. Um, that's not something I want to do. <laughs> so, so if that's something that really motivates your kids and you have the time or feel like you really get excited about that, go for it. Um, the one exception to this is when my son was learning to read, he was struggling and not enjoying reading at all. Um, and so I took him to the library to pick out a bunch of books. And I said, you know what, every time you read 15 books, I will take you out for ice cream. And so I put a bookmark in the book that he was reading and we just put hole punches in it. And as he finished a book and once he had 15 books, I took him out for ice cream. And so that was kind of a, a quick and simple, easy way that it was in the book. I didn't have charts that I had to worry about or stickers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really the only thing I've done for rewards. Christy, like you said, we just do what needs to be done. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute too, but 
in our house, I feel like if you're a member of the household, you should be involved in running the household. So obviously that's based on the level of what you're capable of. Um, but that's something that we just started when our kids were little. Okay, how can you contribute? Well, you can put your socks in the laundry, you know, and things like that. Um, until now that they're older, they can do basically any chore. Um, so let's dive into that, the the chore training part of it, because um, we have questions from Emily, Kate, Danny, uh, looks like several people have asked, like, how do you, you know, keep things clean during the school day that it, I think one of you mentioned that it's hard to work in a cluttered environment um, and keeping the space tidy, let alone cleaning, especially if you have littles that are at that stage where they scatter things everywhere. Um, uh, one mom is saying that it's very distracting for her and she's looking forward to warm weather when she can send them outside so that she can get the chores done. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have Danny who has kids that are two and four. And so she's new to homeschooling, but concerned about that balance with the littles and the school and the housework because she's already struggling with that because of their young age. So what are your thoughts for kind of corralling things, keep, especially with littles, but I mean, it's an issue with older kids too, keeping the house clean because again, you're home all day, so it gets messier. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think if you're able to follow Sheila's advice from the um, video, uh, she is the expert at um, you know, just <laughs> yeah, decluttering. Uh, I am not the expert. You can just see the bookshelf behind me. I mean, we just have we have stuff everywhere. Um, so I, I'm like, um, well, which one of you? Some one of you said something about when something needs getting done is okay. Let's just stop and do this. And you definitely have the flexibility to do that, and especially when the kids are young. Because, you know, the school doesn't you know take as long um, when they're young. Read alouds are shorter. Everything that they do is a little bit shorter. So take lots of breaks. And if you see a mess in a room, what I would do, I would tell the kids, all right, you need to go pick up 10 things and put them in the right spot. And so you kind of make a game out of it. And, uh, and it wasn't anything that we scheduled. It's just kind of whenever, uh, you know, it needed to be done. But the one chore that I highly recommend you get them involved with as soon as possible, even if they need a step stool to do it, it's laundry. Um, my kids had a uh, one laundry hamper in their bathroom and they put all their clothes in it. I washed them and put them in the dryer and then they got them out and it was their job to sort through it and get their individual clothes separated and go put them away in their room. Well, every single time they did that, it turned into arguments every single time, you know, oh, well, you put this over here and this. Anyway, so right then and there, okay, you guys, I'm going to go and get your, eat your own laundry basket thing. And you're going to learn to do your own laundry. And once again, I did not take notes. I have no idea how old they were when they did this, but I do remember mm -hmm. my daughter had to get on the step stool to reach down into the washing machine, you know, to get you know, everything out of there. Uh, but it were great. Um, and they were independent on that. I've never had to wash, you know, a uniform, that I'm trying to say baseball uniform or anything. They were all responsible for getting what they needed to wear, when they needed to wear it uh, at a pretty young age. And it's been fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely think that if, if, if we clean as we go, I don't know how you are when you're in the kitchen and you're making a lot of uh, maybe a big dinner or something. I don't know if you, you know, if you can think about at the end of the dinner and you look back and there's dirty dishes everywhere. I can't operate that way. I have to wash a dish and then do what I need to do and then wash a dish and then do what I need to do. And so that's how I operate typically because I get overwhelmed if everything is, is chaos. There's, but you have to find, like Sunny said, your, your level of what you can, um, you know, what is important and, and what you need to do. Um, I think also, I've said this before um, on one of the um, recordings about um, finding out, sometimes we wear, we have so much responsibility that we begin to get weighted down. And when that happens, sometimes I, I often find out that I'm carrying expectations that no one else in the house has. And so no one else is worried about the things that I'm concerned about, about the house. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to find out, to ask questions. You know, sometimes if I'm talking to my husband at night, I, I could say, what's the most important thing to use for tomorrow? Because I have more things on my list than I can possibly do. And so if you were going to either do this or this, what would you think would be the most important? And he always tells me, he often tells me that I'm 
harder on myself than anyone, you know, than anyone else would be. So um, he often says, oh, this doesn't matter to me at all. But, you know, oh, this would be helpful. You know, like if we think about it this way, if we do this, we don't have to do this later, you know, whatever it is, we kind of work that out. And then that helps me to know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you approach the next day and you see that thing undone, it's like, okay, we've already decided that doesn't matter. And we just go on with what is important. Whereas if I don't have that conversation with someone, either my kids, sometimes we're all in a group in the morning and we're having Bible time. We're talking about the day. And I say, I'm debating about doing this or this after we finish, you know, and, and it might have something to do with a responsibility that needs to be done. And we talk it through. And then that just helps me not to feel the pressure. <laughs> So I think communicating when you're sharing a space, and like I said, I have a son who loves things organized and he has a brother that shares a room with him that is the opposite. And so they have to communicate and they have to work it out. And there are arguments like Anne was talking about with her kids with the clothes, but that's part of you, they're learning skills of, of working with people and finding out what's a priority, what's not a priority and dealing with what the reality of how much time you have and how much energy you have and what you have to accomplish. So I think communicating about it helps. Mm -hmm. I really like that point, you know, how much time you have, how much energy you have, and that's going to change from year to year. When you've got a bunch of little ones running all over the house, it's okay if, you know, you look like, if it looks like you live in your house because you do. And so <laughs> give yourself some grace because it absolutely, uh, well, it doesn't last forever for sure. You know, I've got one very independent daughter right now who's off at work right now and, and uh, huh, so it, uh, it goes by fast. And now I've got plenty of time to, you know, mop or do whatever, you know, whereas before <laughs> uh, it's like, well, you know, uh, it's clean enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I think being aware, you talked about the communication piece of it, the expectations of others. If you are a clean person and your other household members are not or vice versa, you may seek more of that, like, I don't know, tension, I guess would be the right word for it, where the clean person gets frustrated by messes more than the messy people do. So just like when you kind of gear your homeschooling towards that kid and the way they learn, also pay attention to who's being impacted by this. And like you guys said, talk about it, figure out what has to be done, what needs to be done. I'm the very clean one in my house, but if no one else is coming over, I can let my standards slip a little bit, but my family knows they better not open the front door to anyone unless it is clean on our main level. And so it, it's so funny because even my kids now will say, oh, hold on, you can't come over for an hour because I need to clean my room first. Like they've kind of learned that that is my standard, but my husband, he could, things could be falling down around him and he would not notice them. Um, so it really, it just depends who's in your household. Um, and if you have littles, yes, it is very hard because they will drag more things out. Um, so just trying to teach them very early. Um, and I loved your idea for doing laundry. We were the same way with dishes. I mean, as soon as you could carry your dishes to the dishwasher, we were doing those types of things just to keep that kitchen cleaner. Um, Grace is asking a question about some motive motivation in the moment words or encouragement for a child who's really dragging and not wanting to do something. She said, sometimes we just have to do things even if we don't want to only get so far. So what, if, what types of things can you do to encourage your kids um, to get those things done, whether it be schoolwork or chores or anything like that, even if they don't want to? Mm -hmm. I think just modeling it yourself goes a really, really long way. One of my least favorite things to do is iron, you know, so when I had to do it, I'll tell the kids, I do not enjoy this, <laughs> but you know, we want, you know, clothes without wrinkles for church on Sunday. And so, you know, here we go. Um, so definitely modeling things, uh, I think goes a really, really long way. I think anything that you can make lighter. I mean, if you can make a, like, uh, Anne was talking about making a, um, a game of it or making, um, you know, um, sometimes we would, like I, I mentioned, setting a timer and just, you know, we don't like to do it. So we just set a timer and we and we do it. You know, um, if, if it's about school, a certain um, subject, you know, um, sometimes my guys, if I'm sitting beside them for whatever reason, it's proximity to me in the younger grades, I think um, just sitting sitting down with whatever I'm doing, if it's work, something they they need to work on independently. If I bring something that I'm working on independently and I sit beside them, 
um, indicating I'm here. And if they are starting to get um, distracted by, you know, the ceiling or the carpet or, you know, like whatever, anything that they get dis distracted by um, or, you know, you know, flipping around in their seat to have their head at the bottom and their feet at the top, you know, like those are the type of things my guys would do if they were distracted, everything can distract them. <laughs> and so if I'm just sitting there, um, maybe um, that might help. Um, I just think lightening things up if you can on, um, you know, making um, things a game, if you can, that can help at times, depending on what it is. Um, I don't know if there was a, was Sunny, was it specific to a certain um, no, she's just saying sometimes it's hard to motivate them to do the things they don't want to do. And she's trying to figure out what to say or do because, you know, the mm -hmm. whole, we have to do laundry or we have to do our sport sometimes mm -hmm. only goes so far. Right. Um, I know, especially middle school age for a lot of people ends up being the time where you've had these kids that do everything you want. And then as they get older, they really fight you there. Um, so yeah, more just general advice on how to keep everyone motivated and doing the things that maybe aren't any fun that you don't want to do, but have to be done. Yeah, right. I think having something to look forward to definitely helps. You know, yeah. if, if you've all been in the house all week long and you know, Hey, let's do such and such. And then we'll go. I, ice cream has come up before. Ice cream is a great, definitely a great thing uh, to, to go do, or just go play in the park. If you get everything done, having something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. My thing. guys for it's um, my son loves to play the guitar. And so he would play all day if we let him. And so I will often use that, like what they enjoy the most. Like let's, I, sometimes I don't allow it during the school day, but if they're really working, if there's something that they're having a hard time with, like math, I could use that as a motivation. Like if you will finish this math and I check it and we get the corrections done, then I'm going to give you, you know, 30 minutes during the school day and you can go ahead and play to your hearts, you know, like, you know, play as much as you want to for those 30 minutes. And so that motivates. Definitely find something like that, something that will like an incentive that will motivate them something. It doesn't even have to be something. It, it could be like math, you know, um, music or, you know, uh, playing if they play an instrument or if there's something they love to do, maybe free reading. You can read whatever book you want to for 30 minutes after you finish this chore. Putting something like that in the schedule can help. Yeah. And I loved what you said there about the schedule, because I know Jen mentioned that in her video that sometimes we don't think about those fun things necessarily. We're just like, oh, we've got to do this and this and this. But if you put it on the schedule, um, I know I've done that with like Friday afternoon. Well, if you do all of these things on Friday afternoon, we'll go do this or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and so I think that when they have something to look forward to, like you said, or even finish this and then you'll have 30 minutes of this is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, absolutely. Something to look forward to. The other thing I like to do is I give my kids some choices, not everything. I don't say, oh, well, you can do your work whenever you want. But I will usually put the stack of books on the table and say, here's what we're going to do now. What would you like to do first? And when they have those decisions and that buy-in, it makes it more fun. Sometimes they say, oh, let's do the hard stuff first. Other times they'll say, oh, I want to do all the fun things first, and then we can do the harder stuff. Um, but I do let them decide kind of the order of the day. My daughter, who's now a high schooler, I let her do all of her stuff as long as she's done when I'm ready for her I don't care what she does so um yeah giving them some of those decisions and freedom and same thing with the chores you know you can't go do xyz until your room is clean or you know you can't do this until you do this um and so the kids are allowed to then manage their own time um but I mentioned it earlier too kind of that collaborative approach which is something that has been a huge benefit to homeschooling that I was not expecting is the fact that our whole family kind of chips in for things. Um, also, my husband works from home, so it probably helps that we're all here all day. Um, but if you see a mess, clean it up. Like <laughs> That's kind of the way we do it. And so now that our kids are older, you know, that's something we started when they were little. If there's something you're able to do, fix it. Or, you know, you can make meals. Even my nine-year-old likes to make omelets and things like that. And he'll, mommy, do you want me to make you breakfast this morning? Um, and so we just take a very collaborative approach to life. And I mean, that's our family culture. And so wherever you can encourage that, I think that that's a good way to do things where everyone kind of knows what they're responsible for. 
Um, mm -hmm. We have an interesting question here that I had not thought about from Amanda asking about advice for a mom who's ADHD. She said she's not hyper, but she struggles with staying on task and on schedule and gets behind and discouraged because it's her fault that her kids are mm -hmm. behind. Uh, she has five kids, nine and under. So that's a lot of management there. Any tips or ideas for somebody like that where maybe you as the parent are struggling to stay on task? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those top three things for the day that you want to get done, if you can just um, get a checklist going. I don't know if a checklist motivates you. It motivates me. I don't know. Um, uh, sometimes I will write things down just to write the check mark that I did it. You know, I'm one of those people. And so maybe your kids are too. And maybe, um, you know, you never know till you try. You know, maybe use just a sticky note or whatever it is. Um, each day, write down those top few things that you need to do. Know that you can't do all of the things, um, mm -hmm. but that, you know, when things get to the point where you just feel like you're not accomplishing something, then that is, that comes in and it's helpful for me. Um, if, um, you know, making a visual stack, I think of the schoolwork that was mentioned where you can kind of see what you're accomplishing visually as you go, um, you know, whatever system like that works for you that helps you to get through the things that you need to do. But I think definitely prioritizing tasks, whether it's chores or whether it is, um, you know, the school things. And um, yeah, definitely, you know, put the top three. And, um, and, and once you once I accomplish something, then I start accomplishing more. And it just grows from there. So if I feel like I can do those top things that are really bothering me or weighing me down or that I really need to do today and, and get that out of the way, then I, that frees me up, I feel like, to start, you know, okay, and then start to accomplish what I need to for the day. Yeah, and I think with the school schedule, um, I, I know you, it's very easy to feel like you're falling behind, but if you are do if you're moving forward in that IG, you know, you're getting somewhere, but you might want to think about doing what they call a loop schedule where you've got all your subjects and let's say you did, you know, ABC and D today, but you didn't get to EF and G. Well then start EF and G the next day. So, and you know, you don't do the A, B and C and D again until you get the EF and G done so that you, um, well, yeah, you just you just keep on going that way. Um, yeah. So that's one way to do the loop schedule. Um, let's say you want to make sure you do math every day. Make sure you do that and then loop all the other subjects. And there's different blog posts and things about how to run a loop schedule. But that would be a good idea in your situation, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a great point. If you don't finish all that you set out to do, that doesn't mean that you're failing or you're never going to catch up. A uh, personal story from last night, in fact, I had the staff all set up and my son and I were working on things. Um, and we generally work until the kids go to bed because I'm working during the day. So it's kind of a weird schedule. Um, but I was looking at the time and I was like, oh, I don't think we're going to get to science today because we're getting close and he's still doing his reader. And, you know, I was kind of watching that. I was like, oh, shoot, what do I want to do? Um, and as we got closer, I was like, nope, it's already time for him to go to bed. So I said, okay, sweetie, we'll just start with science tomorrow. We'll do two days of reading for science and then we'll be fully caught up on that. So mm -hmm. I do just kind of check off what did we do and come back the next day. And if there's something like that that we didn't get to, it's fine. We do it the next day. So remember that you do not have to homeschool only from nine to noon, Monday through Friday. You have any day that you are free or available, or if you've got an extra 30 minutes here on a Saturday, pick up that read aloud and get something done. That's kind of the way I like to do it. Um, if it's a task that you're totally procrastinating, I have this more with work than I do with my homeschool. Um, but if it's something that I just don't want to do and I'm, I'm kind of putting it off and getting distracted by other things, I will mm -hmm. schedule. Okay, tomorrow at noon, noon to one, I am not answering messages. I'm not doing anything except finishing this one task. Um, so that might be helpful for you. I'm also seeing somebody mentioning technology. Turn off your phone when you're homeschooling. Yeah. <laughs> Christy, were you about to say something? Like yeah, I was going to say, Alexandra makes a good point. You know, sometimes we're pedaling and we're pedaling and we're pedaling and that's the answer. We need to, you know, we need to pedal till we finish the things. And sometimes we need to stop and take a rest. Um, you know, if I think I realized this week um, there was a, a field trip that I was supposed to be doing today. In fact, that was canceled. And when you are so excited that something in your schedule gets canceled, that you just feel like 
singing the hallelujah chorus, then maybe you have too much on your schedule. And so it's time to have some rest. And so I think rest is so important. And um, if you haven't built rest into your schedule and time that you can have alone time, that is very important for me too. Like Alexandra mentions, I have four children and there are times that I do need to have some time to read a book that's not sunlight related or maybe it is related maybe it's you know but maybe it's just time to just read something that I want to read or whatever it is that recharges you um, staring at a wall you know like whatever it is that you need to do or you know build it into your schedule when they're when your kids are really little it might be small small moments during nap time but um, I would say build that up build them up to knowing that um, you know we have time where we're quiet during the day for at least some point during the day and just you can increase that as they you know as you need to, but um, you can start small with that and build that in a little bit and have just a little bit of, mo of a moment to catch your breath. Yeah, and same thing, I'm seeing a question from Heidi about the toddler is very disruptive during school, what do you do? Um, and yeah, same thing there, you've got those quiet moments when that child is taking a nap, that's your best bet to work with the older kids or if your kids have different bedtimes, like I said, I work up until bedtime with my kids. So that is kind of unusual. Not a lot of people do that. But if you're finding that is when your house is the quietest, or maybe it is getting up early with one or two children before the other kids are up and working with them, that might be a good time as well. I mean, I just kind of squeeze in school wherever I can. It would be lovely to do it all in one block. But oftentimes it's we're doing math right now. Okay, two hours later, now we're doing language arts or whatever it is to get it all done um, and in there. Now let's talk about the outside of the house things. Christy, you mentioned taking on too much. And I think a lot of times as homeschool parents, we're like, oh, let's do the co-op. Let's go on the field trips. Let's do all the things. Um, so what about those outside the house activities? How do you prioritize? Obviously, if your kids want to play sports and do extracurriculars, you know, is there such a thing as too many activities? What do you do if you feel like you're, you know, outside so much you can't even get school done? You know, what do you guys do in those situations? Hmm. Yeah, we definitely have to trim back. Um, this, this year, um, one of my guys decided to do far too many electives in co-op and learned the hard way. We did have him finish through the Christmas break on some of those and then let him off the hook and, and, and canceled the, you know, didn't do the second semester. Um, but, you know, he had to learn that lesson of not putting too much on his schedule. And, um, and he learned, we tried to tell him and, and it didn't work. Um, you know, we could have like just put our foot down and said, you know, but I, I thought it would be a good learning experience. And so he did learn through that. Um, I learned through that all the time, you know, that I'm doing too many things or trying, you know, I'm spread too thin. And then the other way too, there are times that I realize, wow, we scaled back because we had too much going on and we scaled way back. <laughs> so maybe we can add something now, you know, so it is just, I think the thing is, um, to realize, um, a mom told me this years ago, you don't have to accomplish everything this year. You don't have to do all of the things, you know, you want to, maybe you want to do sports and you want to do drama and you want to do music or, you know, whatever it is. And you don't have to do all of those things each year. Take a look at what you're doing. I know there are people that, uh, limit to one or two activities, you know, they have certain, <laughs> they have certain, um, you know, guidelines in the family to, to prevent that kind of over, you know, overcrowding of the schedule. I think that's great. Um, but find what works for your family. And just um, if you realize you're doing way too many things, then, then definitely scale back. And also, you know, um, for the age of your kids, when my, when I had a baby and a toddler and a preschooler and a first grader, my first grader was an extrovert and he wanted to do the co-op and it was a fun co-op and he loved it and it was great for him, but it was not fun and great and lovely for everyone else. And so we did that for a year. We let him do that fun thing. And then the next year we talked about it and said, we cannot, this is not fun for the baby and the toddler and the preschooler that are being drug along for this long day. It was on a, it 
it was um, on a Friday. Um, co-ops tend to be on Mondays and Fridays, and those days are hard, I think. But um, but yeah, that was um, uh, what we were doing, and we had to. We just had to say it's, it was a really great thing, but we had to make a choice. So sometimes we have to say no to really great things to make a fit for everybody. Yeah, that's true. I think you need to always weigh the pros and the cons. Mm -hmm. We have a Friday co-op too, and it's uh, enrichment classes. You don't do any sort of, you know, this is your math you're going to do here, things like that. So it really is wonderful, but it is parent led. So when I joined, that meant I'd be teaching something every semester. So did I really want to do that when my kids were little and, and, you know, have that kind of commitment? No, I didn't. So I waited till they were in fourth grade and sixth grade. And it was great. They had more choices for their classes. And I had fewer years ahead of me to, uh, mm -hmm. to teach classes there. And it really was a great fit. Um, I think you can weigh pros and cons with all of the different sports and things like that. Because just because it's available doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but my daughter did some dance uh, when she was a little older. And, you know, yeah, they had a, um, you know, three-year-old dance class. And, and that might be exactly what you want. And that's totally fine, you know. But if it means that you've got to draw, you have an hour-long commute or something to do it, you know, when, when they're three years old and they're really, you know, <laughs> not going to learn. Yeah, you know, they can only learn as much as a three-year-old can. When it comes to it. So weigh those pros and cons before you jump into any sort of activity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, and what you guys said about limiting your kids, um, before the pandemic, my daughter was on competitive dance team and we were at the dance studio all the time. And I did not realize how exhausting that was until the pandemic happened and everything was canceled. And I was like, oh, I can breathe. And now my son can do stuff. And like our whole life was wrapped up in this, right? So after that, we realized, no, we really need to limit our kids to one to two activities, or they can do stuff together. They both did theater together uh, last semester and had a blast with that. Um, and I gave my husband and I a date night because we dropped them off at theater and then we could go to dinner. Um, but definitely, like you guys said, kind of looking at what do I have time for? Um, because I work, I've never done a co-op that required me to do anything other than drop my kids off because I knew I did not have the capacity to do that. So yeah, really weigh those opportunities. And I love what you said, just because something's offered and it's there doesn't mean you have to do it. So, you know, if you've got a lot of kids to look at, okay, well, if your sibling's doing this, do you have time for this and try to make it as equal as you can. But, but yeah, definitely limit those activities to what's not going to wear you out and be exhausting. Um, real quick, we are running low on time as per usual, because there's just so many great things to say, but I would love for you guys to share your best tip for either staying focused at the end of the school year, we're recording this in April. So there's people that are kind of, it feels like a slog at the end of the year um, and they're struggling to stay focused and get that school done. And then ways to motivate those kids to work as efficiently and independently as possible coming into the end of the school year as well for people that are wrapping up their years. So if you guys can share your top tip for those types of things, that would be great. Yeah, our motto has always been every day that we can do school, we do school. And that means we'll have, you know, just a, a you know, start our summer even, even earlier. Um, so, uh, you know, that kind of, as the kids get older, that kind of helps because they really understand that consequence. Well, you know, mm -hmm. if I skip history today, well, that means I have to do it the next day. And that just pushes everything out a day. So mm -hmm. they figure that out pretty quickly. That yeah, if they do school every day they can, they will get it done. Um, so that's been helpful for us um, as we've gone along. Yeah. One thing I did towards the end of this in the second semester one year when all of my guys were ready for summer, it seems like really early. It wasn't even April yet. I don't I don't remember which month it was. Maybe like, I don't know, to get us through February, the end of February or early March, I think um, I made a list of every subject. And then just on in a word document and I typed every week that we had remaining and it was different for um, each of my guys because we do sunny cover your ears. We do the like a sticky wherever um, <laughs> we, we, we don't stay on the same week. And so um, sunny. <laughs> Sunny I like to stay on the same week. That's why she's giving me a hard time about it. <laughs> so, um, so if you are um, someone who who doesn't do that, then then you know, just like I wrote down all the you know how many weeks we had left, and it was a visual in front of us. I made the the you know the subjects colorful. 
in different fonts. And then I just put how many weeks. If we were on week 28, then I would do 28 through 36. And then if we only had 34 weeks for math, it might be, you know, week you know, whatever through 34. And so anyway, whatever it was, however many weeks we had left in every subject, and then they loved marking that off. When they finished a week, they would go and mark that off. And I had everyone's right there together. So it wasn't intended to be peer pressure, but it kind of worked out that way. And you don't have a classroom to give them peer pressure. So, hey, it works, use it, you know. Um, so we, um, that helped us finish out a year, one year, whenever we were, you know, getting to the end and running out of the steam. Yes, I agree. A countdown works so well. Um, this year is actually the first year my kids are in the same week as each other. Well, like Christy was saying, I do not like to, some people will just charge through the HBL and get it done. And then they might be in a different week in language arts or science. I do not like to do that. That is the one one uptight thing that will drive me crazy is if I'm in a different week. So I will finish the language arts assignment or the science worksheets or whatever's hanging out there before I move on to HBL for the yeah. next week. Um, that said, I will sometimes save a few read alouds for the summertime. So remember your IG, your instructor's guide is a guide. You do not have to read every book if you find that it's too much. Um, or if you want to save some in the summer, what I found we were doing is we would do all this awesome reading during the school year and then summer would come along and it would be like, well, what do we do now? And we would just have nothing <laughs> left to do. So I actually do intentionally save some read alouds now just so that we can have some fun family reading to look forward to. It also takes that pressure off at the end of the year. I mean, I, I stay with the schedule the first half of the year pretty well. And so it's usually those last few read alouds that I'm saving towards the end of the year when the weather's getting nice and we don't necessarily want to be doing school. Um, but like Christy said, my kids oftentimes have been on different weeks too. So they kind of, that competition of, oh, I'm going to finish my math book before you do, um, can also be very helpful where the kids get excited about that. Um, and like Anne said, that if you're doing school earlier, that's totally fine. That just means you get more breaks. So um, we've done that as well. I just kind of show them, here's what we have left. And I will say those last six weeks of the IG have always been the hardest ones for me personally, <laughs> just because you're so close. But, you know, you can modify it however you see fit for your family. So let's go ahead. We're going to wrap up. I'm going to give you guys some announcements so that you know it's coming. This is our last homeschool helps and hacks of the spring. We'll take a little bit of a break over the summer and then we'll come back with more in the fall. So if you love these um, events, don't worry. You can replay them in the Sunlight Connections app or on our YouTube channel and see stuff maybe that you missed earlier in the year. Um, if you're part of our 2022 to 2023 newbies class in the Sunlight app, we do have our final Sunlight Newbies live event on May 3rd. So you still have one more there. If you're our brand new newbies, our 2023 to 2024 newbies, we'll explain that more as we get towards the fall and the start of the year. We're kind of at a weird time in the year if you're in the US because people are wrapping up a year and getting ready to start a year and all the different things. Also tomorrow, uh, April 21st, if you're watching this live, is when the Sunlight Summer Reader announcement will come out. So if you're familiar with Sunlight Summer Readers in the past and you're wondering what's going on this year, all of that will be revealed tomorrow. So make sure you're tuned in. We're also doing our Sunlight Summer Reading Challenge again this summer so you can win prizes and get your kids reading all summer long. Also coming up in June, June 1st and 2nd, will be our online Sunlight Connection Summit. So while we won't have homeschool helps and hacks or newbies lives, that will be a two-day event full of sessions like this um, and others that are designed, whether you are brand new to sunlight or you've been a long time sunlight or we'll have something for everyone. So even if you have friends that are maybe curious about homeschooling, please invite them. This is a great alternative if you can't make it to convention or there isn't one near you this year, um, you'll still be able to get the same types of questions answered um, in that event as well. So that'll be June 1st and 2nd. We'll have more information on Sunlight's website coming up shortly. Also, Anne and Christy are going to be at conventions as well. So if you have one near you, you might get to meet these ladies or some of our other mentors that you've seen in our Sunlight app as well. So make sure if you do have one in the area that you come you can buy things at a discount. You can get your questions answered um, and talk with us live there. And Christy, thank you so much as always for joining me. You guys always offer such great insights and advice. 
And then John and Amber, thank you for running the chat for us. If we did not get to your questions, I was trying to see them as they were coming, but they were pretty fast. So if we did not get to your questions or if you're watching a replay later and have a question, please post it in the comments because we'll all be there and see it. And we would love to answer those or give you tips and tricks from our years of homeschooling. And so everyone, thank you so much for being here with us today.